yesterday we had our, the 80th birthday party for my dad. Uh, we brought him to our house, helped him try to get up the steps to our house, which we accomplished, and had a nice little birthday party for him. His birthday's not until this week later on, but this was a good time for my brother to come down. And after all the festiv festivities were over, Susan and I decided uh, we would take a walk around the neighborhood and to do so maybe try to relieve our guilt for how much we ate on Thanksgiving Day. So we, we took a little walk around, and uh, as we were walking, we came upon this young dad, and he was playing soccer in the yard with his, with his boy. And in my heart, I, I thought, wow, it's a beautiful day, and what a wonderful scene to be walking around the neighborhood and to see this dad out with his son with a soccer ball, and they're kicking the ball, and having a good time. What a, what a great moment that they can latch on to throughout their life together, you know, as dad and son. And as, as I got closer, though, um, my mood changed quite a bit because then I started to be able to hear what the dad was saying to his son. You need to get closer to that ball if you're going to be able to protect it and kick it. Come over here and get closer to that ball and you kick that ball this way. What had started out in my mind as being a, a beautiful time together between the father and son made me think of the, the power of words and how words can, can change the whole dynamic of a scene. And we've all seen it and we notice it uh, maybe at the, at the store or in a public place. And you, you see a, a, a dad or a mom speaking down to their child in such a way that not only do you know what it's doing to the child who's hearing it, but it also changes the scene of everyone else who's around who's there too. It makes me feel uncomfortable. I don't even know the people, but even I'm hurt by it, and I don't even know them. Now, we know this phrase, and I've used this at the beginning of a lesson before, but it's I wanted to bring it forward again today because it's really one of the, the greatest lies that's ever been put forward by anyone who made up cute sayings, and that sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. It's so untrue. And for any of us who, for all of us who've been hurt by the words of others, we know that really sticks and stones hurt less sometimes than words do because a wound that is produced by someone throwing something at me and hitting me will heal quicker than the wound of a word that's given to me that hurts my heart and my soul or cuts me down as a person. And in doing so, that wound lasts longer many times. So this really isn't true. The truth is that sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will always hurt me. That's the truth. And I, I even like what this, um, what this person wrote. I think it's cute. Let's go two slides forward. If you can. One more. There, this one. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but names will scar me forever. Could you please just throw rocks? I like that one. <laughs> because it's the way it seems to be. In Proverbs 21, 23 from the ESV, the Bible says... He who guards his mouth and his tongue guards his soul from troubles. How many times have we wished that we could take back the words that we have just spoken but can't? Go to the next slide. Here, so here's a woman. She's got her mouth covered because she's just said something she wished she hadn't said. And we've all been there, haven't we? Oh. much trouble or that was way more hurtful than I meant for it to be. Oh, that miscommunicated or it communicated too much my heart. I didn't want to say it, but I said it. And now look where I am. I've, I've really thrown myself into a bad way. So consider words can encourage but words can also devastate. Words can console but words can inflame. Words can inspire. But 
words can also kill dreams. Imagine if we told a child, you have potential. I like you. God's going to use you in powerful ways. I believe in you. How that could change the course of a child who doesn't think he amounts to much. Who doesn't really believe in himself. Who might be inspired because of my words and what I say to him about his life that he will ingest into his heart and to begin to believe in himself. Versus, you get over here and kick that ball and you, you do this right. We've all been guilty of it. But it's important for us as Christian people to understand the power and value of our words, to guard them carefully, and to understand what they can do. So much so that in James 1.26, James writes, if anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. And there are many reasons why this is the case that we will explore. One of which, of course, we'll look at towards the end of the lesson, which is the most pointed, I think. And that is because our words at some point will eventually reveal the content of our heart. And so the best way for us to repair our words is to repair our hearts. And if we have hearts that are critical, eventually we're going to say words that are critical. If we are despairing in our hearts, then our words are going to be despairing eventually. So the best way for us to have better words is to heal our hearts. The New International Version says those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues, deceive themselves. And the Wycliffe Bible, Wycliffe Bible says, refraineth not his tongue. So all these are action-based words or concepts that show us that in order for us to keep a rein on our tongues, it's going to take some work. We're going to have to work at it. Because if we just simply say what comes to our minds, we're going to say things that hurt people. Or saying things we shouldn't say. We've got to be vigilant with regards to our tongues. And make sure that the things that we say come from, pour forth from a good heart. But also we understand the weight of the words that we say. Guy in Woods from the Gospel Advocate Commentary explains that bridleth comes from two words. To bridle and to lead. And we understand this when it comes to the concept of, a, of an animal that is bridled, that, that this animal has been put under control in order that it may be led in the right direction or in the direction of the master. And such is the case for us. We must bridle our mouths, our tongues, so that we may be led in the way God wants us to go. It portrays a man putting a bridle into his own mouth, not into someone else's. This is what we want to do. We want to shut other people up, don't we? <laughs> okay, turn your Bibles to James chapter 3. It's going to be our text for today, as you might have guessed. James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. For we stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man able to bridle the whole body as well. Now if we put the bits into the horse's mouth so that they may obey us, and we direct their entire body as well, behold, the ships also, though they are so great, are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder, whether the in, wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things, Behold how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. For every species and of beasts and birds and reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. 
It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Does a fountain send out of the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives or a vine produce figs? Neither can salt water produce fresh. Let's, let's consider then the teachings we find here. First, a teacher must carefully guard his tongue. A teacher must carefully guard his tongue. Now, I don't say this in order to diminish our teaching pool. Or maybe I do. Because as, as a teacher, it's very important. And it's, a, it's a, a burden upon me as a teacher to not stand in the way between you and God's teachings. I, I try to measure my words carefully. I try to inspire you in the direction of Scripture, not to present myself in the place of Scripture or to be a hindrance to you understanding and knowing Scripture. It's a heavy burden. And it is one that causes me great care in, in what I say on the pulpit. Because I realize the teacher must carefully guard his tongue. In, in the same way that a, a Christian is out in the community and people are measuring what Christ is all about by the words you say, so people measure what Christ is all about by what I say. Be careful what you say. Uh, I may have criticisms about our elders, but I'm not going to say them. I'm going to work on those in my heart because I want to uphold our elders, and I want you to too. And when I'm out in the community, I speak up about the Northside Church of Christ, not down, because I want people to love God. The things that we say matter. The words we use matter. It comes down to this. Teachers have received a special gift from God and they need to be good stewards of the gift. Knowing more than most, they know God's high standards best and need to keep their minds free from all evil so that only pure water comes from the spring of their mouths. Turn to Galatians chapter 1 for a moment. Galatians I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even though we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so I say now again, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to that which is you have received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. I use this scripture only to illustrate the importance of staying true to scripture. I think one of the things that, is, that sets our congregation, our church apart, is our dedication to and when you come here, that's what you're going to hear me preach. That's what you're going to hear in class. You're not going to hear a lot of clever stories. You're going to hear what the Bible has to say. It's what sets us apart. It's being protective of what God wants us to know. And I appreciate our elders holding us to that task as they have throughout the generations here. These were more noble-minded than in Thessalonica, Acts 17.11 says... For they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. We're bound to teach what God wants us to hear, and that is his word. Secondly, the prudent man will always monitor his tongue. So not only is there a burden, is there a responsibility upon teachers, of course, and we as teachers when we teach others and as we present the gospel in the community, but also... The prudent man, the smart man, the wise man, the righteous man will always keep, ch 
check of his tongue. We'll ride on his tongue. We'll keep a tight rein on his tongue. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. For every species of beasts and birds and of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. So since it cannot be fully tamed and controlled, we must bridle it. We've got to try. We've got to put every effort we can to allow God to give us the, the strength to be able to measure our words carefully. The tongue needs to be kept in check. There's normally far greater value in keeping one's own counsel and holding one's tongue than letting it wag, saying stupid, incomplete, hurtful, or evil things. That's why I let him say rather than me, but it's true. Number three. Never underestimate the power of words. Here are the two examples that are given. The rudder. Small, but powerful. The bit. Small, but powerful. Big force. Able to be controlled by a small bit. And this just shows a little boat here, but imagine a, a large ocean liner, a big ship. And the comparison between it and its vastness and the smallness of the rudder, but the rudder, by moving from side to side, can steer the ship in different directions. This is the illustration that is used in speaking of the tongue, of our tongues. Our tongues are small in comparison to its size compared to the rest of our bodies. But don't underestimate his power for good and for bad. Careless words can be explained and diminished but never removed. It is as if the forest is reduced to burnt wood stumps and ash and never regrows again. Let us not turn our lives and those of others into an ash desert by imprudence and lack of forethought. Be careful and measure. So here are some points under that point. The first is the tongue can be as dangerous as fire. Now, I shared with you last week, or the week before, a couple of my experiences with fire. They aren't that great. Um, don't use gasoline to try to get leaves to burn. It's not a good thing. It burns your eyebrows off. It's not good. Uh, so I'm, I'm thankful when you think about it uh, that fire is the example that is used. Um, we had uh, uh, Daniel's roommate Josh visiting with us, and this week we wanted to go to uh, Whitaker's Point, to Hawksville Craig, and we drove all the way down to um, Boxley and got there, and there was a sign, closed due to forest fire. Well, I was disappointed, and I thought, well, it's a beautiful hike, and we couldn't do it because someone was careless with fire either campfire or smoking or something. They, they were careless. And because of that, they created a fire which burned and, and closed the trail. So I'm thankful then because I can relate to that when it comes to my tongue. I've got to be careful what I say because one small spark of a thing that I say carelessly can cause a huge, out-of-control fire. It can ruin someone's reputation and it can ruin mine. It can crush someone or inspire someone. So we understand fire, it's volatility, it's enormity, it's inability to contain as it gets out of control. And so a careless word, a gossip that is said can grow. But think of it from the positive too. If I say something inspiring to someone who's on the verge of despair, think of the beauty that can grow in that person's life. I might save their life something that I say to them. Behold how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. Colossians 3, 8 and 9. But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices 
1 Peter 3 and verse 10, whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. Philippians 2, 14 and 15, do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may prove yourself to be blameless and innocent children of God. James 4, verse 11, do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. Ephesians 4, 29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only as such as a word is good for edification according to the need of the moment that it may give grace to those who hear. Matthew 12, 36, and I say to you that every careless word that men shall speak, they shall render an account for it on the day of judgment. For by your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. Do you think the Bible has something to say about our time? says with it we bless our Lord and Father and we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessings and cursing. My brethren these things ought not to be this way. Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? The reason the water comes out bitter is because it comes from a bitter source. For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The good man out of the good treasure brings forth what is good. And the evil man out of his evil treasure brings forth what is evil. Who said these words? Jesus. How then do we change our tongues? We change them by understanding by what it does. But we also understand that the only way that my words will ever really be different is if my heart fails. <coughs> so I've got to just not say unkind things. I've got to be kind to say kind things if I want to be kind in my words. And so I work on my heart to change my heart that it will guards his mouth and his tongue, guards his soul from troubles. And so I'll end today with this quote. Words can inspire and words can destroy. Choose Lord's well. It's about for prayer. Father, we are thankful for these words from the Bible. Remind us of the power of words. You give us the privilege of presenting the gospel with our mouth. Telling others about Jesus, about your spirit, and about you. You give us the privilege of using our tongue and our mouth to speak the truths of scripture. We pray to you. The Lord, it is difficult for us in our hearts at times to check our words, to bridle our tongue to understand the power of the things that we say. So I pray, Lord, that we can make a commitment today to using our words to encourage and inspire and uphold and to take people from despair to hope, from hate to love, and that you will use our mouths in a way that will glorify you all stand together and sing. I'll offer this invitation now.